How about now? Is it working now? Okay. All right. Yeah, that's wonderful, all of those young folk. I was wondering where all them pizzas was coming, going to. Uh, now, now I know. Now I know. If you have your Bibles tonight, let's turn to the book of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Let's all stand if you can. If you can't, just stand in heart. Amen. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse number 25. Many times we find that people will preach on the prodigal son, but they forget all about the other brother. And tonight I'm going to preach you a message that I've entitled, A Brother with a Bad Attitude. And uh, let's look here in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse number 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh into the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because, thou hath, uh, ha, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came he to his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou hast never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, who hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It, it, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening as we look into this passage. May we ever be reminded that you love to see lost people saved. Help us, God, tonight to see ourselves <clears throat> in this passage Help us, God, to always focus upon what you love most, and that is people. That, God, you would help us tonight to move forward, to reach out to our community, and help us, God, to see lost people saved. Help us be happy about that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tonight, as we look in this passage, I don't know if he is, he's filming me. Is that for a purpose or are we on TV or what? But I, I, I like to be down here in the bottom where I can see everybody. But uh, tonight, as we look into this passage, many times when we come to this passage, we find that there are people who, uh, who focus on the prodigal son. Many times we talk about the prodigal son, and, and we, we see that this prodigal son, uh, uh, this prodigal son is the primary focus of most sermons, and tonight, uh, that's not going to be the case. I want to focus a little bit on this brother. At the point that we came into this passage tonight, the prodigal son has already came back. The prodigal son has already asked his father for all of his inheritance. He went out to a, a far-off country, the Bible says, and, and, and his, uh, he, had, he had squandered all of his living. Uh, everything that he had inherited, he spent in a foreign land. The Bible says that he had, he had squandered it on riotous living. Or basically, uh, he, he spent his whole time partying it up. And he had all kinds of friends while he had good money. And then all of a sudden, toward the end of his story, we find, uh, we find that he's in the... In the, uh, uh, the, in the place of slopping the hogs, and he, the Bible says that his son come to his senses. He said, hey, he said, I'm going to go ask uh, the father uh, that if I could come and be his slave, and, and I'll come back. And he makes up this big, big thing that he's going to tell his father. He comes back home, and before he even explains anything, the father is already running out to him to embrace him, and he says, hey, kill the fatted calf, put shoes on his feet, and put a ring on his finger. The young man never, ever got an opportunity to talk to the father about what he had done. The father, in essence, had forgiven the son when he seen him moving toward the father. I want you to understand this. 
that the son had never asked for forgiveness hardly, that the son had, in his actions alone, the son had come back and the father says this, he says, uh, he, he says, you're, you were dead and now you're alive. And so we understand the fact of the prodigal son, but sometimes we forget about this brother with a bad attitude. Here in verse number 25, we find that this, uh, the Bible calls him the elder brother. The other brother. This elder brother had this uh, position in the family. The, the elder brother during this time would have had this great position in the family where this, he would have owned, uh, owned more than half of what the father had given him. The Bible tells us that he, he had already separated his inheritance off to his sons. And so we find that the father had given everything at that point and there was nothing else to give the sons. So when we find that the, the younger brother comes back, that he's spending what, he's angry because what the older son owned, the father was now giving it to the younger son. Does everybody understand that? That the inheritance had already been divided up. The, the older brother had already got his. The younger brother had already got his. And the father was really there with nothing left because he had already divided the inheritance up. So when this, uh, the younger son comes back, the, the, the other brother is angry at the father because the father is giving what actually belongs to the older brother now to the younger son. And it, make, it boils his blood. The, we, the first thing that we see here in this passage is this, is the position that the older brother held in the family. It was a position of privilege. The firstborn son was always the one who had the most privilege. Back in the day, they didn't divide it like, like we would now. If I have two sons, one of them gets 50% and the other gets 50%. No, it didn't go like that back in this day. In this day, the older son got the most of, of the inheritance, which was probably 75 to 80% of the inheritance. The younger children divided the rest of the inheritance. So the older son would have got more than any of the other sons. That's why uh, back in the, through the Bible, you'll find this, uh, this birthright given to the firstborn son is something that is much more than what the other children would have ever gotten. So he had held this position of great privilege when he was born, the firstborn son. So we not only see that he had a position of privilege, but we also understand that this firstborn son had a position of productivity. The Bible says that he was out in the field working, <clears throat> that he is, was out doing his thing when he heard all of the, the singing and dancing. This was not a son that just rat, laid around on his laurels. This son worked in order, to, uh, in order to make the father proud. I'm going to tell you something, friend. That's a hard lick to take. I don't know about you. I've, I, I was raised by my grandfather and my grandmother. That's why I'm kind of a, a school of, uh, of hard knocks is because my papa <laughs> didn't play no games. Uh, he, his cure for ADHD was a belt that was around, and he cured me like real quick. Amen? Uh, the, and and the, the thing that I want you to understand is that uh, trying to work hard to please somebody is a, a, is a thing that only that individual can understand. There's people in the world today that work their whole life to try to make their father or their mother or their parents or their grandfather or their grandmother, whoever it is, proud of them. And so when we look at this, this uh, son here, make note of this. He is spending, the father is spending his inheritance on a son that was willing to leave him. And he was, he was also taking, uh, he was also not only doing that, but giving it to a son that literally had taken everything and destroyed it. The whole time, this other son worked hard. We see that he had this position of privilege. He was born into the first son. He had all rights to everything that he's telling the father here. Make note of this. 
It's the bad attitude that brushes, brushes me wrong when I read this passage. It's really the bad attitude. It's nothing to do with the son and his, his inheritance or his productivity. Because I'm going to tell you something. This boy was a hard worker. We'll find later that we know he's a hard worker because the, the father never responds to him when he says, I've worked for you all of my life. It, in essence, the father here understood what the son was doing, but he was trying to bring the two together. There's nothing worse than family, family trouble. You know what I'm saying? I mean, people can, uh, in, in family, family ties, people love to extremes. And in family ties, people get angry to extremes. Within, when it's with your family, it's, to, it's, it's always to an extreme. It's always to an extreme. That's why the Bible tells us that there, there be enemies of our own household. Why? Because Satan will take those, those and, and, the, and take that love that they have and turn it into, into a dreadful hate. And it's so important here that we're seeing some of that happen and play out here in this brother with a bad attitude. So he held a position in the family, a position of privilege because he was the firstborn son. He got most of the inheritance. And we saw, see that he had a position of productivity. The son worked. He, he didn't lay back on his laurels and just get his father to hand him something. He took what his father had and he was working with what his father had. And the great thing is his father was still living at home with him. <laughs> He was still taking care of his father. He's not only taking care of his family, he's taking care of his father too. And all of a sudden, we see that he had these problems. He not only had a, had a position that he held in the family, but he had a problem with the festivities that was happening there. Notice here what it says uh, here in verse number 20, uh, 25. He says, he, he says here, he says, and the, his elder son was in the field, so we see he was being productive. He wasn't out somewhere else. He was in the field working. And, and the Bible says, and, his ha and he, as he came, he drew nigh to the house, and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked them what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Oh, my goodness. The brother come back home. Listen, you and I know when family issues happen, nine times out of ten, you and I will take sides. It's just a, it's a common thing. Any argument. That's why you have churches that split, and it's so horrible. Why? Because everybody takes a side. You can't stay quiet on it. And so here, here this, this son who took off, this prodigal son who took off, I'm sure that the son... The older brother had conversations with the father about the son, about the day that one day he was going to return, about the day that he, he, he probably told his father, he said, uh, my brother, as, as the way he did you, he's not welcome here anymore. Uh, he, I don't want him in my house. I don't want him around me. I don't want to hear anything about my brother anymore. Matter of fact, I would say if it was in our time today, I would say that they spent days and possibly months already talking about this other brother when it became to happen. Can you believe my brother left? He took everything. And, and I hear, I hear through the grapevines that he's down in the city. And he's, he's literally spending everything that the father made. And he's doing it in a way that of riotous living. He's, he's down there with girls and, and down at the bar. And he's doing all of these things. And, and him and the father, I'm sure, talked about those things. And then finally, uh, after a few months, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation. I know I have. After a few months, you don't want it to consume your thought process. And the father probably looks at the son and says, hey, listen, let's not talk about it anymore. It's what's done is done. Let's not talk about it anymore. I'm not talking about it anymore. And then all of a sudden, the scene plays out. The other son comes back. And the love, you know, they call this the the pro, the the. Uh, parable of the prodigal son, I beg to differ. It's really the parable of a loving father. It has nothing to do with the prodigal son. It's, it's really how the father loves. It's really not about the prodigal son. <laughs> and so here this son comes, comes back, and the brother who has already set this sternness up against the, 
the, uh, against his brother doesn't even understand what the father feels. When the father sees that person coming back, when the father sees that youngest son coming back, there's joy and happiness in his heart that he's learned his lesson, he's coming back home. He was happy. Matter of fact, if you read the passage there, and he says, and not many days, he says in verse 14, he says, and when he had spent all there, on a, uh, uh, there arose a mighty famine in the land, began to be in want. 15, he says, he went and joined himself with a citizen of the country, uh, sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would fain fill his belly with a husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had come to himself, he said, how many hired servants does my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? He said, I will rise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And he goes into all this stuff. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. And he goes in and you know what he's doing there? He's repenting in the pig, pig pen. He's not, the father's not hearing him repent at this point. What he's doing is he, God is already preparing his heart to send him back to the father. What caused him to think about the father anyway? It was the love that the father had already showed him. I mean, let me tell you something, friends. I've, I'm, a, I'm, I'm rolling up on about 60. I've got a few years to hit 60. I've got kids of my own, okay? When they get adults, my grandmother used to say this, son, whenever your kids are young, they'll step on your toes. He said, when they get older, they step on your heart. And sure enough, that's what's happened here in this passage, is that this son is going to come back. And notice what, when, he, when, he, when he comes back, what's happened. And, and, he, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and no one worthy to be called thy son. He said, the father said unto his servant, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. He said, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for my son who was dead is alive again and who is lost and is found. Now, let me explain something to you. If you go back to the original language of that, they're all, it's all one simultaneous interaction. The son comes back with a story. Father, I want you to understand. And, and during that same time, the father, while he's over here explaining what he done, the father's saying, hey, 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 get the fatted calf. Get the fatted calf, put a ring on his finger. My boy, he's come back home. While he, this guy is repenting, the father is doing this simultaneously. They're not interacting with one another. It was the son who came back made the father happy. And the, fa and the father at that point was a merry man. But here's the problem. He had a son that had a problem with the festivities. Uh, he had a problem with his motives, really. Uh, this man did not care that his brother who was lost is now found. He didn't care like the father did. I'm going to tell you something. We rejoice when people are saved. We don't rejoice like the Father does. Hey, we're happy. Church members rejoice in a, in a crazy way. You know what I'm saying? Somebody who has been a menace to society or whatever you would f consider that to be, don't get, don't get too deep into it because that you'd bring my name up into it because that's what I was. And then that person walked down an aisle way. They give their heart to Jesus. And then we as Christians sit back and say, hmm, I wonder if that's going to hold and stick. That's not your, that's not, not, should never be your concern. Amen. It, it should be, uh, it, you should be happy about that. You should be uh, joyful and thankful that, that the things had worked out for this person to come to know Christ as their Savior. This old guy right here, this brother with a bad attitude, had a problem with his motives. This man didn't care about lost people, even at the point that it was his own family who was lost. This man didn't care about the love of the Father. 
You see, the father loved the, the prodigal son, but his other son didn't care whether he loved him or not. Let me make this very clear to you. Not everything in life should be set in stone. Not everything in life, when you make a decision on it, should you not be pliable on that decision. I'm, I'm telling you, when it comes to people, you should always be pliable. When it comes to seeing people and to come to know Christ as their Savior, you should always. Don't be pliable on the gospel. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this, that there are people who are in our families that we, we uh, have witnessed to over and over again. Never give up witnessing to those folks. Never give up on wanting to see them saved. Even at the point when pe people, family members of yours or, or people that you know despise you, you should always want to see that person saved. Amen. I mean, I've never had an enemy that bad that I didn't want them saved. Because if they get saved, they'll become my friend, I'm sure. It's important that you know that he had a problem with, a, he didn't care about the lost and he didn't care about the love of the Father. The third thing is the man didn't care about the glories or the, glo the laurels or the glory of the Father. He wanted the glory for himself. You see, he had been working so hard to make the Father happy. And all along, what made the father happy was his son returning back. It, it, what made the father happy didn't make this, it, the, the older son happy. It, it, he, he was working hard to just say, Father, just be proud of me. When what made the father proud was to see his son come back. Hey, I've, had, I've got adult kids, so I know all about it, friend. You know, I've, I, I left and went... On the mission field, my youngest son was in, a, in diapers. I'm talking about months, only months old. And when I went to the mission field, I didn't go like most people go to the mission field. I went to the mission field by selling my house and everything that I owned. I didn't go with a mission board. I didn't go with, I didn't go with some kind of group. I just felt like God wanted me to go, and I, I sold everything. When I got to the mission field, even missionaries thought I was crazy. <laughs> I mean, they was like, what? <laughs> when, when, I, when I got to the Philippines, the first nine months, I got $38 from the United States. $38 in nine months. $38. I didn't go to church to church to try to get money. Never did that. I just felt like God called me, and that's what I was going to do. I sold my house. Had a savings account. Told my wife, "Listen, <clears throat> I'm gonna. We, we'll just go for a year. Let's just go for a year. I'm not gonna be satisfied. I don't. I, I thought that I could go over there for that year and satisfy God. Didn't work that way. I ended up staying ten, ten years. Never came back to the United States in ten years. Not not once. We see here, friend." that the glory has to go to the Father, not necessarily to the Son. He's the one who controls it all. This man didn't care about uh, even about the Father. He did what he did to get, uh, to get what he could out of it. How do we know? Because whenever he comes back and the Father starts talking to him, he starts talking to the Father. He starts talking down to the Father. When you read it over it, it looks like he's just making a point. But I want you to think of something here. Those of us who, are, who have been around for a while knows what respect was. I'd never talk to my father like this boy talked to his father. I did this. I did that. Throwing things in his face. No, not happening. But this old boy right here did. He turned, he, he would, this man even saw his service, the Bible says, as slavery. Look what he says in verse number 29. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Well, this is the craziest stuff. So here's what I want you to understand. The father is having a great, wonderful time. They're partying. And the son comes in, cold water brigade, and just throws, throws down on the Father right in front of everybody. Listen, he says these things. These many years I have served you. The word there, served, literally, when you go look it up, slave. 
So what he literally said to the father is, Dad, all of these years while he's out squandering everything, I did whatever you told me to do. I was literally your slave. There's a difference between a son and a slave. That, hey, when you start thinking that you're a slave and no longer a son, there's ramifications of that. Listen, the son, a son has the same nature as the father. A slave doesn't. Uh, the son has a father and the slave has a master. The son obeys the father out of love. A slave obeys the father out of fear. The, the son is rich, and the slave always sees himself as being poor. So here's what he tells the father. Father, I've worked all, I've been your slave all this time. Matter of fact, he says this, I've never transgressed any commandment that you gave me, liar. That's a transgression in itself, amen. I've never, I've always done the right thing. And he begins to throw this up. In it. And the last thing he said is this. He said, and I have done all of this stuff, and you never gave me not one kid, not one calf that I could make merry with my friends. Well, this man is a fool. He had already divided his hair up. The father had already given him everything that he owns. Not just one calf, cattle on a thousand hills. That's his oldest son. He had already divided the inheritance out. Well, you have to understand that when he divided the inheritance out for the younger son, he had to divide the inheritance at that point. He couldn't go come back later and redivide the inheritance. Why? Because he would have been making more and the inheritance for the younger son in a later date probably would have been more. So when he goes to divide the inheritance out, he divides it right then and there. The older son had got more than just one calf. This older son focused so much on this one fatted calf. And, 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 and he forgot that the father had given him so, a cattle on a thousand hills. Isn't it crazy how when we get focused on one thing, we forget everything else? So we see this son here, this son with a bad attitude, we need to understand that this son didn't care anything about what the father wanted. He was only caring about the son. We see the problem with the festivities. The next thing we see is the problem uh, that he had, well, not only with his motives, but his mentality. His mentality, he was proud, disrespectful, arrogant, defensive, and angry when he approached the Father. I love this passage. You want to know why? I want you to see how this Father changes it all up at the end of the passage. It, it, we see that he had a problem with his methods. This, this son uh, came back. Notice how this young man handled his anger. Uh, when he got angry, he attacked the Father. Uh, when he got angry, he criticized everybody else. When he got angry, everybody else was to blame, not him. It's important that you understand that this man came in pointing fingers at everybody. Listen, the greatest thing that you and I can do in God's kingdom is when we're wrong, admit we're wrong. Because the more you try to block, gloss over it, the worse, worse it gets. Take it from a preacher, amen? I mean, back in the day, you wouldn't believe his preachers make mistakes, amen? I remember one time, I, I, I was at a church come fresh off the mission field, and I was doing 11 services a week, 11, while I was in the Philippines. Every day, every week, 11 services every single week. I did a service every single day in the morning. I did, a, I did a service on Wednesday night, Sunday night. I did a prison ministry on Tuesday nights. And so I did 11. I had a deacon that went with me, and guess what? 
the deacon never heard the same preaching message. 11 services a week, now try that on for size. It's crazy. Those of you who teach Sunday school or something, you know that's, that's absolute. It has to be from God. I felt like if he went with me, I didn't want him to hear the same message, so I'd preach the different service, a different sermon every day, every single day. At night, I'd stay up to preach in the morning. During the day, I'd go home to study to preach at night. But notice this. When this guy, when you come to start criticizing other people, it will always come back on you. It will always come back on you. We see that this son, he had this problem he, with the festivities. First, it was his, uh, his motives. And secondly, it was his mentality. What, what caused this son to be so angry is because he had already settled in his heart what he was going to tell his brother when he got back. He'd already probably thought, if my brother ever comes back here, I'm going to give him a wife for He's not going to treat daddy like that. And all, in, all in, in essence, he was going to take up probably for his father when all his father wanted was his other son. It's crazy. He, he thought that probably he, he was going to take up. And then when he seen his father not get angry, it angered him even more because his father didn't get angry at him. Listen, you, all of us in here are not really so super spiritual that we ain't been mad at somebody and be like, hmm, I'm going to reap what they sow. <laughs> and then when that does happen to them, you're like, hmm, yeah, that's what you get. You know what I'm saying? I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. But the truth of the matter is, is that, that that's not the way the Father thinks. The Father thinks so much higher than ours. His thought process is so much higher than ours. I have... I have stuff right now that I'd leave. Uh, I keep saying, vengeance is the Lord's, not mine, you know. And then, uh, and then to, to be honest with you, man shouldn't even say that. Say, I pray God has grace on them. The last thing is this. We see the petition that he heard from the Father. Notice here in, in, in the, the last few verses there, he said, and he was angry in verse 29 and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Hold on just a minute. We see the same, we see the same reaction from the father for both boys. Both boys got the same reaction. When one boy come back, the Bible says the father ran to him. When this boy wouldn't come in, guess what happened? The father went out to him. Let me, let me explain something to you. You're not going to come to the father without the father coming and getting you. You're not going to get saved just any time you want to. It has to be the Father come. It has to be Him through the Holy Spirit to come and talk to you first. You don't have the right to come in and entreat God about anything. He will come to you. Amen? Everybody understand that? And then afterwards, we call that Lordship, following Him as Lord. Amen? But it's the Father who initiates the contact every time. It's the Father in this situation who initiated that contact. You're not just going to come in on God's terms. Uh, you're not just going to come in and, and not come in on God's terms. God, God, uh, God is going to send the Father or the Spirit to you first, and then He's going to come. And it's, He did the same thing here. The Father come out, and He entreated Him. Uh, the first thing I want you to see is this, what He says here. He says in verse 29, And He answering said to His fathers, Though, lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgast I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou hast never given me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed the fatted calf. And he said unto him, this is the father talking to him, Son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is that he's telling you right there, he's done divided the inheritance up, right? Yeah, between both of them. He said, everything that, that's left here belongs to you. It don't belong to your, it don't belong to your brother. It's wild, it, it's wild when you think of it, that the son is really not coming back to the father's house. The son's coming back to the brother's house because the father don't own it anymore. Think of that. And so here the father is. 
begging the sons to get along with each other. He, he goes on to say, and he, and, and, and he said unto them, uh, unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry, that we, we, that we, not I, that we, we should make merry and be glad for this. Thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. The thing I want you to pay close attention to here is this in verse 31. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. You know what he's telling his brother here, uh, he's telling the son here? First, the, this, this uh, if you go back and read the original language, the, 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 the father here is pleading with the son. I'm not saying that God begs. This is a parable, right? I'm not saying this is God begging anybody. I'm telling you that this is God showing his heart to his son what's important. You ever done that with your son? You ever cried in front of your son? I've cried in front of my adult sons. I have a, I, my, I, my kids have always been in church until I come to the United States. And when they come to the United States, it's like they pop smoke on me. They, they're gone. You know, my kids right now don't go to church. There's not a time that I don't plead with them not to go. Uh, I often think of this, and, and, and I have literally got in front of my sons and apologized to them. See, they went to the Philippines because I was called, not because they were. You see, they were living out the, the, the calling that God had on my life. They were raised in a place, and I'm going to tell you something. We didn't have the things you have here in the United States. My boy was 10 years old. The one who I was talking about in diapers come here as a young man, young boy, 10 years old. Here's This will blow your mind. We didn't have running water. I pumped the water. When my boys take a bath, they take a bath in their underwear because they take a bath outside in a, in a public area. I'd pump water while they... So I come here, my boy, 10 years old. We arrive here. I go to my brother's house. He let me stay at his house when I first come back from the mission field. And I walked into the shire and I said, son... I said, see this right here? I turn it, and the water comes out. And I said, this is hot water. This is cold water. Put your hand under there. You get in a shower, you burn yourself up. I, he looked at me with the dumbest look. I said, son, do you understand? Hot water, cold water. Yeah, Dad, I understand hot water, cold water. I said, well, what's your problem? You look like you're crazy. He said, who's pumping the water? <laughs> Had never seen that in his whole life. And, I, and then all of a sudden I realized this boy was in diapers when I took him. And so now, flash forward, my boys are grown. You know what I do? I'll take and send pictures of my boys when I baptized them, send it to them. Just to remind them who you are. I'll send them Bible verses, and my boys will answer me on Bible verses, but not go to church. I'll, I do everything. When they come to my house, uh, you know what my boys do when we sit down to pray, uh, when we sit down to eat? My boys will wait until I pray. They don't pick up a fork before we pray at my house. what I wouldn't give to see my boys flourishing. But you know what? I can't force them to do that. They're adults. My boys live, live in Lexington. They, they'll kind of call me every now and again. I get this little bit of excitement, you know, when they'll call me and they'll share something with me about God. I, I get really excited. I tell my wife, hey, look, they, they're, they're showing me something about God here. And my wife, we just sit back and just cry. Listen, friend, I'm going to tell you something. Don't be so pliable. Don't sit, be so strict that you're not pliable with people. You have to love 
people. This old boy here, this father had come out. And what the words he's using here is almost words of concern and begging. Those of us who have, who have adult children, those of us who have family members who are outside the will of God, we, all, we understand the language that he's talking here. He's going out to his son who was angry and begging him, don't mess my boy's time up. My boy's come back and he's alive. Please, God, don't, 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 you don't make him go back out. Let my boy stay here. Can I, because the father loved the son. He loved both his boys. He didn't want these things to come in between his two boys. How did it, he knew what the other boy thought. Why, the other boy had already voiced it to the father. If he comes back here, he ain't welcome here anymore. While the other son's out in the field, the father's trying to make the young boy feel welcome. And so when the other boy wouldn't go out, the Bible says there that he was out, went out pleading him. And, and it was not only a petition of pleading, but it was also a petition of promise. What he's saying here is this. He's saying, I value our relationship together more than all the works you've done. That's why he mentions here. His boy talks about all the works he's done. And in verse 31, he says, And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. You know what he's saying right there? It's what he's saying. Son, you don't have to work to make me proud. I'm already proud of you. You've never walked out on me. This time that we had together in this relationship is worth far more than the fatted calf. I've killed one fatted calf for your son to make him feel, for your brother to make him feel as if he's welcome. But the truth of the matter is, you've pleased me all along. And don't let this come in between our relationship. That's what he's saying. He's literally, it, when you look at it like that, this has nothing to do with the prodigal son. This has everything to do with a loving father pleading the case of both sons to get together. That's what he's doing. He's holding the hand with one son and holding the hand with the other son and saying, boys, you want to know what pleases the father? You living together in unity. And sometimes God has to do that with us in a church. Amen. He, he has to do that with us in a church. <clears throat> he says, I value our relationship together more than I value the work that you've done. And the last thing is, it was a petition of priorities. A relationship with God is much more important than the works that you're doing for God. The relationship will produce the works but get the relationship right first and then let the works generate from that relationship. If you try to get the cart before the horse and do the works without the relationship, you will jack everything up. Amen? Get the relationship correct and the works means... Now, listen, work is a four-letter word. Amen? I mean, work ain't been so easy. But if you look back at the beginning of time when God created Adam in the garden, the Bible says that he put Adam in that garden to work and keep it. You know, work wasn't a bad term in that day until sin came on the scene because all of a sudden when God kicked Adam, uh, uh, expelled Adam and Eve out of the garden, work became a personal thing for, a per for them personally. They had to work for themselves rather than working for God. Working for God should never be a burden on anybody here. And if it becomes a burden, take a step back, realize what's going on in your life, and, and get back to the basics of loving God. There's nothing wrong with taking a little bit of time for yourself and say, hold on just a minute, I'm on, I'm on back. The, the last little bit, I, I, I resigned my pastorate of Irvin First Baptist Church in October of last year. Every, every week I want to work. <laughs> Every week I want to work. But not every week do I get to work. So I'm valuing this time. God's let me have off a few Sundays 
and I'm valuing this time. But let me say this to you. The relationship is worth more than the work. Because if you have a relationship involved in it, the work is so much more sweeter. It's important that you understand. This brother with a bad attitude, I don't know what happened to him. The story ends right there. The parable ends there. That, there's one parable that people call in the, par- par- in the Bible a parable when Lazarus <laughs> is, is uh, in the bosom of Abraham. I believe that that's a real story. This is a parable. I think, I think Lazarus is in, in the bosom of Abraham. I believe that Lazarus is with God because that's the only parable that Jesus even mentions a name in. This here is a story, and he's trying to give it a parable, a picture comparable to the things of life and the things of heaven. And he's telling you, if you're this brother with a bad attitude, when people come in this church and they give their heart to Jesus, don't doubt that. Only encourage them. Only encourage them. Only encourage them. If, if, if they fall off the boat, only encourage them. Only encourage them. Only encourage them. You don't know why I say that? I was at Bethel Baptist Church for years. I, could, I, I fell off the boat. You wouldn't believe that. Somebody such, so big and spiritual as me, I fell right off the boat. I missed church one Sunday. Got easier to miss the next Sunday. Got easier to miss the next Sunday. Got easier to miss the next Sunday. Before you know it, I'd miss so many Sundays. What, what comes in your mind? Does anybody know? Anybody been in that boat, huh? Don't want to go, but why, why don't you want to go, brother, most time? Yeah, and this is, what am I going to tell them? Why well, I've been gone. You get out here, start flapping, then all of a sudden you, can't, you think you can't come back because you have to explain something when you come back to church. And that's what happened to me. I missed so many Sundays, I was like, I don't want to go back there. I ain't got no explanation. I ain't got no excuse. That's what the devil put in my mind. I was sitting at home on a Sunday getting ready to watch the Super Bowl. Getting ready to watch the Super Bowl. And I was making jalapeno, I was cutting jalapenos. Super Bowl Sunday. Guy from a church come knocked on my door. I opened the door. His name was Billy Powell. Billy Powell's no longer with us anymore. Billy Powell took his own life. But this, this, this day, Billy Powell came and knocked on my door. I opened the door, and you could have seen on my face. Oh, my goodness. I looked at him. He knew automatically what I was thinking. He went just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, hey, brother, you don't have to explain that to me. He said, I just come over here to see you, tell you I loved you. You come back to church. You don't have to tell nobody nothing. I, my heart literally snapped in two. And I said, Billy, I'll be there Sunday. And from that day forward, my life took a great hold after backsliding. After backsliding. Because then I was able to see the grace of God, how God sent somebody to my house. Listen, most people who cut people down have never been on the downside of it. You understand that? Most people who will cut some, and you and I are not called to cut some people down. You're not, you and I are not called to, to, uh, to wonder about other people. That's not my, my position. My position is to love people and love God and love people. One day I'll come back, I might get to fill in again. I'm going to preach the two greatest commandments ever given to man, love God and love people. It's important. Here in this passage right here, this brother with a bad attitude, I hope one day I'll be able to see the ending of the story. It might not be somebody in heaven with me. It might be Jesus there in front of me, and I'll be like, hey, 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 hey. I remember this parable. Can you tell me how the story ended? You know what he's probably going to say? Tony, you are the story. You're the story. Because I've been this guy. I've been this guy. 
used to when I first started preaching back in 19, oh, 98. Back, back in 1998, when I, I took that Bible, I'd beat you to death with that Bible. Because I thought, if I stepped on your toes, boy, I did that. I did my job, baby. I stepped on their toes. You know what? God's not concerned with people getting their toes stepped on. He wants to step on your heart. Amen. Getting your toes makes me move my toe. Getting me step on my heart makes me move my whole person out of the way. I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to share with you tonight. You might be here, and maybe, maybe uh, God has spoken to you in some way. Friend, tonight might be the night that you can rededicate your life. It might be a night that God has called you to do something, and you can most assuredly step out on faith in God. If He's called you to do it, He will most assuredly equip you to do it. And tonight might be that night. Let's pray. Do they usually do an invitation on Sunday night? Let's do an invitation, and then we will dismiss. But let's not dismiss too early, because God might be calling you to do something here tonight, to make a choice. Don't be like this brother with a bad attitude. Change your motives. Change the message, amen. And tonight might be your night. Let's stand and pray. Father, we just come before you tonight. We thank you so much for your word, this infallible, inerrant word of God. And Father, we place our trust completely upon it. And tonight, God, we ask that you would do a mighty work in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.